Hello and welcome to the Download. Coming to you live from our Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen studio here in Detroit, Michigan. I'm Brad Eli. The Archdiocese of Atlanta, led by Archbishop Wilton Gregory for the past 15 years, is now one of two dioceses in Georgia under investigation for clerical sex abuse. The statewide probe will be looking for evidence of cover-ups involving clerical sex abuse. This investigation is even more important as it involves Archbishop Gregory, who will be replacing disgraced Cardinal Donald Worrell as Archbishop of Washington later this month. But an investigation is only as good as the records obtained by law enforcement. Catholics familiar with Gregory's past have little faith that neither he nor church leaders he appointed will be overly transparent with hidden files in what's called the secret archives. Today, Christine will give us an in-depth analysis of this investigation. Stephen will give us some insights into Gregory's less than transparent past. And Rodney will present an overview of similar investigations going on across the country. So Christine, what is happening down in Georgia? Yeah, big news, the latest uh, a state attorney general to launch a criminal probe into sex abuse cover-up is in Georgia. Just happened, and um, this is by, the announcement came from Attorney General Chris Carr, who is a Catholic, um, basically saying we're gonna be looking into the, the, to the two dioceses of Georgia, the Archdiocese of Atlanta, which of course is currently headed by Archbishop Wilton Gregory, but he's going on to Washington, D.C., and then the other diocese, which is Savannah, so we actually have a local news report here where he's quoted announcing this and talking about the investigation. Let's go ahead and roll that clip. Abuse by any adult of any child is unacceptable. That's why Georgia Attorney General Chris Carr told us he spent the last several months spearheading efforts to launch a new statewide investigation to uncover allegations of child sexual abuse by priests or others in the Catholic Church. So long as the church is open and transparent, it will say to victims, we appreciate you, your story matters, you have people that have your back, um, and I think it will ultimately lead to healing. In an exclusive interview, Carr explained how the Prosecuting Attorney's Council of Georgia will run the investigation and confirmed both the Archdiocese of Atlanta and the Diocese of Savannah are on board. My expectation is that it, that it is open that the books will be open. In November, the Archdiocese released a list of 15 priests, deacons, and seminarians in Georgia named by Archbishop Wilton Gregory as credibly accused of sexually abusing children. Nearly half have died, the rest removed from ministry or convicted. In an emailed statement, Archbishop Gregory wrote, I offered our full support and cooperation to Attorney General Chris Carr. I reiterate my genuine concern for all who have been hurt directly or indirectly by abuse of any kind by anyone and and I renew my commitment to healing, transparency, and trust. And for Carr, himself a Catholic. The goal has to be justice being done. Okay, so as you mentioned, both the Archdiocese of Atlanta and the Diocese of Savannah, under Bishop uh, Gregory Harmeyer, both, both of them submitted lists, printed, uh, published lists of accused clergy. People question, though, how transparent Gregory actually is because listen to this the number of supposedly accused credibly accused predator priests in Savannah which has a population of 85,000 Catholics was 16 okay Atlanta which has a population of 1.2 million Catholics identified only 15 credibly accused clergy which uh, okay I mean it's kind of, uh, it's very difficult to believe that that's the full number. And we do know in at least one case, there are names of priests that are not on the list. Now, the priests that I'm about to talk about were not accused, of course, of sexual abuse of minors, which is what they're limiting their, their list to. But that's deliberate. Again, it's deliberate. We spoke about it before. They del just like in New York and just like all over the country, they limit their list to only sexual abuse of minors. They will not open up to homosexual misconduct with adults because they know it would blow up that list wide open. Two names that were not mentioned on this list, Father Juan Carlos Arce and Father Juan Fernando Areza. Very quickly, both of these men were removed from ministry in 2010, admitting to homosexual misconduct. They were actually having sex with a layman in the rectory of the church. They were caught, Archbishop Wilton Gregory removes them, and guess what? Father Oretza was placed back in active ministry just last year. He's named pastor of a parish. He's pastor to this very day, a man who admitted to homosexual trysts. Uh, so this is the sort of thinking of Archbishop Wilton Gregory. But P 
people are concerned about whether or not he's really going to be transparent uh, with regard to this investigation. So we're just waiting to see what are they going to uncover. For instance, Zach Heiner, who's executive uh, director of SNAP, which is a victim's advocacy group, had this to say. He said, quote, I think the big question is, are they going to get access to all records, even those that would be actionable, or will those archives be hidden and not turned over? I'd like to have faith that they will get the full cooperation and get every single record, but I don't think that's likely to happen. It's like the police asking the drug dealer to show them where the stashes are. The drug dealer will show you the stashes that you're going to find anyway, but for the hidden ones, why turn them over? And that's exactly right, which is why various other state law enforcement agencies have conducted surprise raids, because they don't trust these dioceses to turn things over. At, they're probably, you know, and rightfully so. Another person who's expressed concern is Susan B. Reynolds. She's an assistant professor of Catholic studies at Emory University. This is what she said, quote, what Catholics want and need right now is accountability. There's no justice and healing without truth. This is a moment of reckoning for the church, both locally and globally. And it's not an exaggeration to say the church is in a period of crisis. I would say that's pretty much an understatement. But very quickly, just remember, Archbishop Wilton Gregory was the very instrumental in crafting and drafting the Dallas Charter back in 2002 when we had the big sex abuse crisis that exploded. He was, the, he was the leader of the U.S. bishops. He was responsible for placing uh, Theodore McCarrick as the public face of the response to the sex abuse crisis. And this is a man whom critics say Gregory knew all about sexual predation. And yet this is the man who placed that person, McCarrick, to be the leading face of that. So, Well, what really broke it open for me was to understand that Gregory was ordained by Cardinal Bernadin in <laughs> Chicago, that he was raised up from being a priest under Bernadin. And for me, knowing the past of Bernadine, it, that's like, wow, okay, so you're one of Bernadine's guys. Now, l there was quite a blowback when Gregory was named to D.C. because of his whole past. What is some of that past that Catholics were concerned about? Yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's rotten, uh, uh, to put it uh, succinctly. I, I, yeah, I think uh, Attorney General Cart is very likely to uncover some very ugly truths uh, in Georgia, particularly in the Archdiocese of Atlanta. I, I'm just, uh, uh, the, the, the figures you cited, that amazes me. You know, Gregory suggesting that there are actually fewer predator priests in Atlanta, with, which has 15 times the number of Catholics uh, as, as Savannah. That's just... Well, maybe his sterling leadership, they're all so much holier. A lot of holiness there, I guess, in Atlanta, yeah, um, he, so yeah, in, incredibly. Um, Gregory has he, so he's been uh, uh, Archbishop in Atlanta for almost 15 years, and he's really been able to um, paint and uh, craft a narrative uh, over the past two decades that he's very uh, uh, active. He's, he's he's had a lot of his success in uh, stamping out clerical sex abuse, but but the reality is quite the opposite. Actually, uh, uh, he's has, he has a very checkered history at best. For example, um, as Bishop of Belleville, Illinois in 2004, before he went to Atlanta, Gregory was held in contempt of court for refusing uh, to release records related to um, uh, a sex abuse case involving a retired priest. Just He obstinately refused to do that. And also, for years as Archbishop of Atlanta, he refused requests uh, by members of SNAP to release, to do what he did in November, to release uh, a, a list of those who were credibly accused uh, of, uh, of uh, clerical abuse. Um, he, he issued his paltry list back in November only after uh, the pressure uh, in the wake of um the McCarrick scandal uh, got to be too much, so um, that's really what forced his hand then. Um, another case, in, in 2015, SNAP published the names of six predator priests uh, who had victimized minors elsewhere in other states and had spent time in Atlanta. Now, the, the, uh, the allegations against them actually generated media coverage in other states, but they remained under the radar in Atlanta. Um, now, each of these men was uh, either you know, credibly accused of or had actually admitted to abusing minors. Uh, and, and so, you know, uh, you know, we've talked before, there, when a priest uh, abuses one, he's very likely to, to go on and uh, abuse many more. So there could be very many uh, uh, unreported uh, abuse uh, cases, uh, abuse victims in Atlanta. So, you know, if, if Gregory is so concerned about um, uh, the, the welfare of victims, about preventing abuse, you know, why didn't he publicize uh, these, uh, the names of these priests? You know, at the very least, this could have encouraged any Atlanta victims to come forward to seek uh, justice, healing, and so forth.
Gregory also tried uh, successfully actually to gut a Georgia bill, the Hidden Predators Act, that would have extended the statute of limitations uh, for reporting abuse from age 23 to 38 and allowed victims to sue alleged uh, perpetrators and institutions that enabled or facilitated abuse. Now this occurred just last year, last year, just three months before the McCarrick revelations uh, broke. Uh, you know, really up until the very moment, uh, up until June 20th, Gregory was 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 fighting against uh, victims of clerical sex abuse, not not for them, not on their behalf. Uh, also, la just last December, under the pseudonym Philip Doe, a predator priest victim filed suit against Gregory and the Atlanta Archdiocese, claiming that they quote have conspired, continue to conspire, and have actively engaged in efforts to cover up cases of sexual abuse by clergy. Uh, many observers. Uh, suggests that Gregory has worked against transparency because he actually has a personal stake in doing so. In, in, in 2006, for example, Richard uh, Seip, who was America's leading uh, expert on uh, clerical sex abuse, he published an article claiming that Gregory is homosexual. Uh, Gregory has uh, also been a uh, close ally of Theodore McCarrick for, for years, though of course he repeatedly denies knowing anything about McCarrick's uh, serial homosexual predation of altar boys and seminarians. Now it was uh, during Gregory's stint as Bishop, or excuse me, as president of the, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, uh, that the first wave of uh, clerical sex abuse, uh, the, the, the scandal broke in January 2002. Gregory has repeatedly pointed to the Dallas Charter, which was adopted in June of that year, we see footage here from that, um, as evidence of his leadership in stamping out clerical sex abuse. But. <clears throat> In reality, it was a it was a remarkable failure of leadership because he allowed, as president, he allowed McCarrick and McCarrick's allies to exempt bishops from the charter's provisions, basically giving McCarrick and others like him free reign to continue sexually uh, sexual predation. And we've got a clip of uh, McCarrick speaking at that meeting. Let's go ahead and take a look. And I think that it is important for us to understand that as we come to this to this vote, that we in Dallas we we gave up uh, something. Uh, we gave it up because of a, because of a, a very important uh, situation in the United States, because we, we faced a, a real crisis of cred credibility with our people. We had no choice but to give it up. We, we must move forward. We must put an end to this. Uh, we, we cannot have Dallas 2 and Dallas 3 and Dallas 4. The, the cynicism of that is just, it just blows me away. I mean, the, the, he, he's saying this as he's... Uh, abusing uh, seminarians and others it's it's disgusting now now if if and, and and where are we you know 17 years later well we've had our Dallas 2 Dallas 3 Dallas 4 um, uh, we're you know at a point where the church is fully engulfed in crisis if if Gregory had actually done his job if he had worked to stamp out uh, clerical sex abuse and not essentially provided cover from McCarrick and his allies things could be very different today think how many lives that have been destroyed would still be intact. It's I I it, we just need to pray that Arch that um, Attorney General Carr uncovers all of this. Well, the thing is, a lot of uh, viewers out there might think, well, if he's stonewalling on this, what can be done? You know, but there's Gregory doesn't have control of all the victims mm -hmm. who want to come forward. Absolutely, he doesn't have control of all of those who know where all the bodies are buried, ex seminarians, <laughs> ex priests, people who worked in the chancery, people maybe still on the inside as whistleblowers. This is going on around the country. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have control over all the other information that they found in all the other dioceses. Several, Christine was talking about raids that have gone on, like Saginaw, Galveston, Houston. They're uncovering documentation, and, and the way we were explained to by someone who's in the know with law enforcement is that the noose is closing. So what's going on across the country? Yeah, as, it, well, as you're saying, there, there's an increased awareness in the sex abuse, the clergy sex abuse problem. Um, you had it, you know, among people who knew seminarians, you know, 20 years ago, there was kind of, you know, whispering and dinner table talk about, oh, I saw these gay stuff going on in the seminary. And then you have the 2002 revelations. Uh, and then you have the summer, the summer of shame uh, with McCarrick. And then, uh, and now, as you know, this unveiling has happened, now uh, states are stepping in. And Georgia is only the latest in those states that are stepping in. We have uh, 16, including Washington, D.C., uh, who are now con conducting investigations. And uh, Attorney General uh, of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, uh, he's the one who kind of blew the lid off of everything uh, in August 
with uh, the Pennsylvania grand jury report that was so, uh, I don't want to say damning because it's, it's it exposing, you know, the rot that's been going on. Uh, he said that uh, authorities from 45 states have consulted him about their own either pending investigations or ongoing. So we're, we're going from, you know, 16 plus Washington, D.C. to 45. That's, that's a massive tidal wave that's going to engulf the church. Um, in between uh, August and December of last year, uh, Illinois um, officials uncovered nearly 700 sex abuse cases. And of those 700, 500 of those had been covered up uh, by the, the dioceses there in, in Illinois. The diocese only released 200 names while uh, the investigators found 700. So th the cover-up here is massive. Uh, in, in the Cardinal Supich of Chicago, he did an interview with CBS uh, claiming that, uh, you know, they're doing good work to stomp this out. Let's see what he says. Supich says a series of reforms adopted by bishops in 2002 have dramatically reduced abuse cases in the U.S. Whenever there is a violation, we name it. We come out with it, we tell people what's going on, and, and uh, we, we make sure that people are held accountable. That's a straight up sure lie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lie, lie, lie. Um, you know, and of course, he never mentions homosexuality as being a big uh, component of this, which it is. Their bishop's own numbers bear this out. Um, and the fact, like Stephen brought up earlier, is that, you know, when you have like 500 names, that's not 500 instances of abuse. That's 500 perpetrators, and they never stop it one victim it's so this is thousands and you know three four five fold what the number of abusers are over course of many years and these bishops are still working to actively cover up what they can um, from september to january new york authorities uh, received more than 550 abuse reports so they opened up their lines for people to uh, to do this and in uh, in uh, february just this year uh, new york voted to increase um, uh, the time that people can report so there's been a, a flood of reports since then. Uh, Michigan authorities uh, have received more than 300 since August and Attorney General, General uh, Dana Nessel is no real friend of the Catholic Church necessarily and no friend of church militant as we find out, uh, but she expects many more uh, victims to be uncovered. So again, from 300, she expects 1,000 or more victims mm. from that. So she's talking about that in an interview. Here it is. In any other um, place, we would call this a criminal enterprise, wouldn't you? It's not just unethical, but I believe that that is criminal behavior. And you can bet if we're able to use our state laws to charge people who have been involved in that kind of activity, then we will do so. These tips continue to come in, and um, I don't think anybody should be surprised if there are uh, people that are active in the priesthood still here in Michigan that end up being prosecuted. She's right. This is a criminal enterprise is a nice way of saying it. That's that's you know the mafia wishes they had such an extensive uh, you know cover up system going on. Uh, the the American bishops have been used to uh, getting away with this for decades and decades and decades. And the sad thing is they're still acting like nobody's on to them. But. But it's not just, you know, uh, faithful Catholics who've been on to them for decades. Now it's the state, you know, prosecutors. And now perhaps even the eyes of federal prosecutors are looking into the bishops. And they're still pretending like everything's hunky-dory. And this tight, it, it sh just shows how, how full of hubris and pride they are because they have no idea of the peril they're in or of the peril that they put souls in by covering these things up by protecting, uh, you know, molesters, the whole thing, it's, it's appalling. I, I've been dumbfounded. Um, I mean, I'll just say this. There are many bishops today who, like you said, act as if it's business as usual. Mm -hmm. They're not taking it seriously. And we know for a fact, because we've spoken to various people, we know for a fact that some of those bishop, bishops are actually under both state and federal investigation in ways that they're not even aware of. So mm -hmm. to me, it's like, okay, fine. You know, if you want to be business as usual, but 
like you said, the noose is tightening. The, the hammer's coming down. Yep. You know, and Dana Nessel said that, uh, wouldn't you call that a criminal enterprise? The lawyers out there watching this show understand that in a very specific way. We're talking RICO there. Criminal enterprise, that's what RICO investigation is. It's a conspiracy out there, taking it all into a hole. When she says that kind of activity, she's not talking about just sexual impropriety. She's talking about the whole gamut of cover-up and the institutionalized crime that's all entailed with that. We're talking RICO on that, which uh, is not probably too far down the road. Yeah, and it's pretty obvious, too, that the appointment of Archbishop Gregory to D.C. is nothing more than to continue covering up mm -hmm. Laurel and his misdeeds and misconduct, who was placed there to cover up McCarrick's misdeeds and misconduct. I mean, it's just continuing on. You'd think they would have got somebody better than Gregory, because we, we, when he first came out, we thought, well, you know, an investigation in his own diocese is probably going to topple the guy. So, well, we'll see what happens here. So, Well, as mentioned earlier, law enforcement asking church officials for documents proving they covered up clerical sex abuse is like asking drug dealers to turn over their stashes of drugs. Our Lord has said there's nothing hidden that shall not be revealed. But that doesn't mean everything will be revealed in this lifetime when it can help the church heal and give those who are guilty time to face the truth and hopefully repent. Catholics must pray and fast that hidden files, information, and testimony come out now when it can do the most good for everyone. God bless.